Chapter Sixteen of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pendulum of Fate. The next day, Thursday, was one of hectic excitement for Gibraltar. Focus on the concentrated attention of town and rock was the battle fleet clogging all the inner harbour with its great grey hulks super dreadnoughts like the standing walls of a submerged atlantis lay close to the quays barges lashed alongside the folded booms of their torpedo nets behind them battle cruisers and scouts formed a protecting cordon far out across the entrance to the harbour the darting black shapes of destroyers on constant guard were shuttles trailing their threads of smoke through the blue web of sea and sky between fleet and shore, snorting cockle-shells of launches established lanes of communication. Khaki of the rock's defenders and blue of the fleet's officers met, passed, and repassed. In wardroom and club lounge, glasses were touched in pledges to the United Service. The high command of the Mediterranean fleet paid his official visit to the governor of Gibraltar, and the governor, in turn, was received with honours upon the quarter-deck of the flagship. But under the superficial courtesies of fanfare and present arms, the stern business of coaling fleet progressed at high tension. It was necessary that all of the fighting machines have their bunkers filled by noon of the following day. Every minute that the channel up under the murky North Sea fogs lay without full strength of her fleet protection was added danger for England. That morning Captain Woodhouse went on duty in the signal tower. Major Bishop, his superior, had summoned him to his office immediately after breakfast and assigned him to his tasks there. Sufficient proof, Woodhouse assured himself with elation, that he had come through the fire in General Crandall's library, tested and found genuine. Through this pretext and that, he had been kept off duty the day before, denied access to the slender stone tower high up on the rock's crest, which was the motor centre of Gibraltar's ganglia of defence. The small office in which Woodhouse was installed was situated at the very top of the tower, a room glassed on four sides like the lantern-room of a lighthouse, and provided with telescope, a telephone switchboard, range-finders, and all the complicated machinery of gunfire control. On one side were trestle boards supporting charts of the ranges, figured areas representing every square yard of water from the nearer harbour below out to the farthest reaching distance of the monster disappearing guns. A second graphic sheet showed the harbour and anchorages and the entrance to the straits. This map was thickly spotted with little red numbered dots, the mines. Sown like a turnip field with these deadly capsules of destruction, were all the waters thereabouts. Their delicate tendrils led under water and through conduits in the rock up to this slender spire called the signal tower. As he climbed the winding stairway to his newly assigned post, Woodhouse had seen painted on a small wooden door just below the room he was to occupy the single white letter D. Room D, where the switches were, where a single sweep of the hand could loose all the hidden death out there in the crowded harbour, it lay directly below his feet. Captain Woodhouse's duties were not arduous. He had as single companion a sergeant of the signal service, whose post was at the window overlooking the harbour. The sergeant read the semaphore message from the slender signal arm on the flagship's bridge, directions for the coal barge's movements, business-like orders to be transmitted to the quartermaster in charge of the naval stores ashore, and such humdrum of routine. These Woodhouse recorded and forwarded to their various destinations over the telephone. He had much time for thought, and much to think about. Yesterday's scene in the library of Government House, his grilling by the two suspicious men, when a false answer on his part would have been the first step toward a firing squad. Yes, and what had followed between himself and the little American, the girl who had protected and aided him. Ah, the pain of that trial was hardly less poignant than had been the terror of the one preceding it. She had asked him to prove to her that he was not what she thought him. Before another day was passed, she would be out of his life, and would depart, believing, yes, convinced, 
that the task he had set himself to do was a dishonorable one. She could not know that the soldiers of the hidden army have claim to heroism no less than they who join battle under the sun. But he was to see Jane Gerson once more. Woodhouse caught at this circumstance as something precious. Tonight at Government House, Lady Crandall's dinner to the refugee Americans on the eve of their departure would offer a last opportunity. How could he turn it to the desire of his heart? One more incident of a crowded yesterday gave Woodhouse a crust for rumination. The unmasking Jamir Khan, the Indian, had elected for himself at that critical minute when it lay in his power to betray the stranger in the garrison. The captain reviewed the incident with great satisfaction. How of a sudden the wily Indian had changed from an enemy holding a man's life in his hand to that friend in government house, of whose existence the cautious Almer had hinted, but whose identity he had kept concealed. Almer had said that this friend could lay his hand on the combination to room D in the signal tower when the proper moment arrived. Now that he knew Jamir Khan in his true stripe, Woodhouse made no doubt of his ability to fulfil Almer's prophecy. And the proper moment would be this night. Tonight, on the eve of the great fleet sailing, what Woodhouse had come to Gibraltar to do must be accomplished, or not at all. The man's nerves were taut, and he rose to step to the bayward window, there to look down on the embattled splendour of England's defence steel forts ranged all in rows awaiting but the opportunity to loose their lightnings of obliteration against the ships of an enemy cardboard ships shadows of dreams in room d just below his feet a hand on the switches a downward push and then lady crandall's dinner in government house was in full tide of hilarity under the heavy groined ceiling, the spread table with its napery and silver, was the one spot of light in the long shadowed dining room. Round it sat the refugees, folk who had eaten black bread and sausage and called that a meal, who had dodged and twisted under the careless scourge of a war beyond their understanding and sympathies, ridden in springless carts, been bullied and hectored by military martinets and beggared by panicky banks now with the first glimpse of freedom already in sight and under the warming influence of an american hostess's real american meal they were swept off their feet by high spirits almost childlike henry j sherman kewanee's vagrant son returning from painful pilgrimage sat at the right of lady crandall his pink face was glowing with humour to consul reynolds who swore he would have to pay for thus neglecting his consulate for so much as two hours, had fallen the honour of escorting Mrs. Sherman to table. Willie Kimball, polished as to shirt-bosom and sleek hair, had eyes and ears for none but the blithe Kitty. Next to General Crandall sat Jane Gerson, radiant in a dinner-gown of tricky gauze overlaid on silk. At her right was Captain Woodhouse, in proper uniform dinner-coat, faced with red and gold. Of the whole company, Woodhouse alone appeared constrained. The girl by his side had been cool in her greeting that evening. To his conversational sallies she had answered with indifference, and now at table she divided her favours between General Crandall and the perky little consul across the table. It seemed to Woodhouse that she purposely added a lash of cruelty to her joy at the approaching departure on the morrow. "'Oh, you must all listen to this,' Kitty Sherman commanded the attention of the table, with a clapping of hands. "'Go ahead, Will. He had the funniest accent. Tell them about it.' Young Kimball looked conscious and began to stammer. "'You're getting us all excited, Willie,' Henry J. boomed from the opposite side of the table. "'What happened?' "'Why, ah, uh, really, quite ridiculous, you know. Hardly a matter to uh, talk about.' Willie fumbled the rose in the lapel of his jacket and searched for words. "'You see, this morning I was thinking very hard about what I would do when I got back to Kiwani. Oh, quite enthusiastic I am about the little town, now, and I, well, I mean to say, I got into my bath with my wristwatch on.' Shouts of laughter added to the youth's confusion. Sherman leaned far across the table and advised him in a hoarse whisper, 
"'By a dollar Ingersoll, Willie, it floats.' "'Well, you might give him one of yours, father,' Kitty put in, in quick defence. "'Anybody who'd carry two watches around—' Two watches?' Lady Crandall was interested. Henry J. beamed expansively, pulled away his napkin, and proudly lifted from each waistcoat pocket a ponderous watch, linked by the thick chain passing through a buttonhole. "'This one,' he raised the right-hand timepiece, "'tells the time of the place I happen to be in. Changed it so often I guess the works'll never be the same again. But this one is my pet. Here's Kiwani time, not touched since we pulled out of the C, B, and Q station on the 20th of last May. He turned the face around for the others to read. Just three in the afternoon there now. Old Ed Porter's got the Daily Enterprise out on the street, and he's tilted back in his office chair, readin' the Chicago Tribune that just got in on the 2-5 train. The boys at the bank are goin' out to the country club for golf, young pete andrews wearin the knickerbockers his wife cut down from his old overcoat sort of a horse blanket pattern you might say the town's just dozin in the afternoon sun and and not givin a hang whether henry j sherman and family gets back or not you're an old dear lady crandall bubbled some day kiwani will erect a statue to you the talk turned to art and the man from Kiwani even had the stolid general wiping the tears from his eyes by his description and criticism of some of the masters his wife had trotted him around to admire. "'Willie, you'll be interested to know we got a painter in Kiwani now,' Henry J. cried. "'Member young Frank Coles, old Henry Coles' son? Well, he turned out to be an artist. Too bad, too. His folks was fine people.' but Frank was awfully headstrong about art. Painted a war picture about as big as that wall there. Couldn't find a buyer right away, so he turned it over to Tim Burns, who keeps the saloon on Main Street. Been busy ever since, sort of taken it out in trade, you might say. Table talk was running at a gay rate when Mrs. Sherman, who had sent frequent searching glances at Captain Woodhouse over the nodding buds of the flower-piece in the centre of the board, suddenly broke out, Ah, Captain Woodhouse, now I remember where I've seen you before. I thought your face was familiar the minute I set my eyes on you this evening. Shamir Khan, who stood behind the general's chair, arms folded and motionless, swiftly lifted one hand to his lips, but immediately mastered himself again. General Crandall looked up with a sharp crinkle of interest between his eyes. Captain Woodhouse, unperturbed, turned to the Kiwani dowager. "'You have seen me before, Mrs. Sherman?' "'I am sure of it,' the lady announced with decision. The other diners were listening now. "'Indeed! And where?' Woodhouse was smiling polite attention. "'Why, at the Winter Garden, in Berlin, a month ago.' Mrs. Sherman was hugely satisfied with her identification. She appealed to her husband for confirmation. "'Remember, father, that gentleman I mistook for Albert Downs, back home, that night we saw that, er, wicked performance?' "'Can't say I do,' Sherman answered tolerantly. Woodhouse, still smiling, addressed Mrs. Sherman. "'Frightfully sorry to disappoint you, Mrs. Sherman, but I was not in Berlin a month ago. I came here from Egypt, where I had been several years.' Woodhouse heard Jane at his elbow catch her breath. See, mother, there you go on your old hobby of recognizin' folks, Sherman chided. Then to the others, why, she's seen all Kiwani since she came here to Europe, even got a glimpse of the Methodist minister at Monte Carlo. I have never been in Berlin in my life, Mrs. Sherman, Woodhouse was adding. So, of course. Well, I suppose I am wrong, the lady admitted. But still, I could swear. The governor, who had kept a cold eye on his subordinate during this colloquy, now caught Woodhouse's glance. The captain smiled frankly. "'Another such unexpected identification, General, and you'll have me in the cells as a spy, I dare say,' he remarked. "'Quite likely,' Crandall answered shortly, and took up his fork again. A maid stepped to Lady Crandall's chair at this juncture, and whispered something. The latter spoke to Woodhouse. 
you're wanted on the telephone in the library captain very important so the importunate person at the other end of the wire informs the maid woodhouse looked his confusion probably that silly ass at the quay who lost a bag of mine when i landed he apologized as he rose if you'll pardon me woodhouse passed up the stairs and into the library he was surprised to find jamir khan standing by the telephone his hand just in the act of setting the receiver back on the hook the indian stepped swiftly to the double doors and shut them behind the captain a thousand pardons captain he spoke hurriedly the captain will stand near the telephone they may come from the dining-room at any minute what is all this woodhouse began i was called on the telephone a call i had inspired captain it was necessary to see you at once and alone tactless with the general suspecting me you heard what that woman from america had said at the table she has eyes in her head i think he still trusts you captain the indian replied and to-night we must act the fleet sails at noon to-morrow we woodhouse was on his guard at once what do you mean we jamir khan smiled at the evasion yesterday in this room captain i burned a roll of plans which i had good reason to wish saved woodhouse caught him up no matter i burned them at a moment when you were in great peril captain burned them yes perhaps to trap me further the indian made a gesture of impatience oh excellent discretion he cried in suppressed exasperation but we waste time that is precious to-night before another word is spoken let me have your card your wilhelmstrasse number woodhouse demanded i carry no card i am more discreet than some the other answered insinuatingly no card your number then jamir khan brought his lips close to the white man's ear and whispered a number is that not correct he asked woodhouse nodded curtly and now that we are properly introduced jamir began with a sardonic smile may i venture a criticism your pardon captain but our critics they help us to perfection since when have men who come from the wilhelmstrasse allowed themselves to make love in drawing-rooms you mean you and the young woman from america when i found you together here yesterday that is my affair was woodhouse's hot response the affair on which we work this night that is my affair be very sure there was something of menace in the indian's tone woodhouse bowed to his demand for an explanation that young woman as it happens must be kept on our side she saw me in france when captain woodhouse was supposed to be in egypt ah so jamir inclined his head with a slight gesture craving pardon for that reason you make a conquest i did not understand no matter the fleet sails at noon and our moment is here to-night jamir whispered in exultation not until to-day did they admit you to the tower captain how is it there a simple matter with the combination to the door of room d with a single stride the indian was over before the door of the wall safe he pointed the combination of the inner door it is in a special compartment of that safe protected by many wires before dawn i cut the wires and come to you with the combination at whatever hour is best for you woodhouse put in eagerly let us say three thirty jamir answered you will be waiting for me at the hotel splendide with our friends there i shall come to you there give you the combination and you shall go through the lines to the signal tower there must be no slip woodhouse sternly warned not on my part captain count on that for five years i have been waiting waiting five years a servant yes my general no my general very good my general the man's voice vibrated with hate to-morrow near dawn the english fleet shattered and ablaze in the harbour the water red like blood with the flames then by the breath of allah my service ends 
Voices sounded in the hallway outside the double doors. Jamir Khan, a finger to his lips, nodded as he whispered, Three thirty at the Splendide. He faded like a white wraith through the door to General Crandall's room as the double doors opened and the masculine faction of the dinner party entered. Woodhouse rose from a stooping position at the telephone and faced them. To the general, whose sharp scrutiny stabbed like thin knives, he made plausible explanation. The beggar who lost his bag wanted a complete identification of it, had run it down at Algeciras. "'I understand,' Crandall grunted. When the cigars were lit, General Crandall excused himself for a minute, sat at his desk, and hurriedly scratched a note. Summoning Jamir, he ordered that the note be dispatched by orderly direct to Major Bishop, and given to no other hands. Woodhouse, who overheard his superior officer's command, was filled with vague apprehension. What Mrs. Sherman had said at table, this hurried note to Bishop. There was but one interpretation to give to the affair. Crandall's suspicions were all alive again. Yet, at three-thirty, at the Hotel Splendide, but when Crandall came back to join the circle of smokers, he was all geniality. The women came in by way of Jane Gerson's room. They had been taking a farewell peek at her dazzling stock of gowns, they said, before they were packed for the steamer. "'There was one or two I just had to see again,' Mrs. Sherman explained for the benefit of all, "'before I said good-bye to them. One of them, by Madame Paquin, father, I'm going to copy when we get home.' I'll be the first to introduce a Paquin into little Kiwani. Well, don't get into trouble with the minister, mother, Henry J. warned. Some of the French gowns I've seen on this trip certainly would stir things up in Kiwani. Jamir served the coffee. Woodhouse tried to manoeuvre Jane into a tete-a-tete -tete in an angle of the massive fireplace, but she outgeneraled him, and the observant Mrs. Sherman cornered him inexorably. "'Tell me, Captain Woodhouse,' she began, in her friendly tones, "'you said a while ago the general might mistake you for a spy. Don't you have a great deal of trouble with spies in your army in war time? Everybody took us for spies in Germany, and in France they thought poor Henry was carrying bombs to blow up the Eiffel Tower.' "'Perhaps I can answer that question better than Captain Woodhouse.' the general put in, rising and striding over to where Mrs. Sherman kept the captain prisoner. Captain Woodhouse, you see, would not be so likely to come in touch with those troublesome persons as one in command of a post, like myself. The most delicate irony barbed this speech, lost to all but the one for whom it was meant. "'Oh, I know I'm going to hear something very exciting,' Mrs. Sherman chortled. Kitty, you'd better hush up Willie Kimball for a while and come over here. You can improve your mind better listening to the general." Crandall soon was the centre of a group. He began with sober directness. Well, in the matter of spies in wartime, Mrs. Sherman, one is struck by the fact of their resemblance to the plague. You never can tell when they're going to get you or whence they came. Now, here on the rock, I have reason to believe we have one or more spies busy this minute." Jane Gerson, sitting where the light smote her face, drew back into the shadow, with a swift movement of protectiveness. Woodhouse, who balanced a dainty Satsuma coffee cup on his knee, kept his eyes on his superior's face with a mildly interested air. "'In fact,' Crandall continued evenly, "'I shouldn't be surprised if one, possibly two spies, should be arrested before the night is over. And the point about this that will interest you ladies is that one of these, the one whose order for arrest I have already given, is a woman, a very clever and pretty woman, I may add, to make the story more interesting. And the other, whose arrest may follow, is an accomplice of hers, I take it, General? Woodhouse put the question with easy indifference. He was stirring his coffee abstractedly. Not only the accomplice, but the brains for both, Captain. A deucedly clever person, I'm frank to admit. Oh, people, come and see the flagship signalling to the rest of the fleet with its funny green and red lights. It was Jane who had suddenly risen and stood by the curtains screening the balcony windows. They look like little flowers opening and shutting. 
The girl's diversion was sufficient to take interest momentarily from General Crandall's revelation. When all had clustered around the windows, conversation skipped to the fleet, its power, and the men who were ready to do battle behind its hundreds of guns. Mrs. Sherman was disappointed that the ships did not send up rockets. She'd read somewhere that ships send up rockets, and she didn't see why these should prove the exception. Interruption came from Jamir Khan, who bore a message for Consul Reynolds. The fussy little man ripped open the envelope with an air of importance. "'Ah, listen, folks. Here we have the latest wireless from the Saxonia. We'll anchor about two, sailed six. Have all passengers aboard by five-thirty.' Excited gurgles from the refugees. "'That means,' Reynolds wound up, with a flourish, "'everybody at the docks by five o'clock. Be there myself, to see you off. Must go now. Lot of fuss and feathers getting everybody fixed.' He paused before Jane. "'You're going home at last, young lady,' he chirped. "'That depends entirely on Miss Gerson herself.' It was the general who spoke quietly but emphatically. Reynolds looked at him surprised. "'Why, I understood it was all arranged.' "'I repeat, it depends entirely on Miss Gerson.' Woodhouse caught the look of fear in Jane's eyes, and, as they fell for the instant on his, something else, appeal. He turned his head quickly. Lady Crandall saved the situation. "'Oh, that's just some more of George's eternal red tape. I'll snip it when the time comes.' The consul's departure was the signal for the others. They crowded around Lady Crandall and her husband, with voluble praise for the American dinner and thanks for the courtesy they had found on the rock. Woodhouse, after a last despairing effort to have a word of farewell with Jane, which she denied, turned to make his adieu to his host and hostess. "'No hurry, Captain,' Crandall caught him up. "'Expect Major Bishop at any minute. Small matter of official detail. You and he can go down to the rock together when he leaves.' Woodhouse's mind leaped to the meaning behind his superior's careless words. The hastily dispatched note, that was to summon Bishop to Government House. Crandall's speech about the two spies and the arrest of one of them, Louisa, he meant, and now this summary order that he wait the arrival of Bishop, would the second arrest be here in this room? The man who carried a number from the Wilhelmstrasse felt the walls of the library slowly closing in to crush him. He could almost hear the whisper and mutter of the inexorable machine moving them closer, closer. Be alone with the man whose word could send bullets into his heart. "'A very pleasant dinner, Lady Crandall's,' Woodhouse began, eager to lighten the tenseness of the situation. "'Yes, it seemed so,' Crandall offered the younger man his cigarette-case, and, lighting a smoke himself, straddled the hearth, his eyes keenly observant of Woodhouse's face. "'Rather odd, Americans, but jolly nice,' the captain laughed in reminiscence of the unspoiled Shermans. "'I thought so. I married one,' Crandall retorted. The ear of Woodhouse's mind could hear more plainly now the grinding of the cogs. The immutable power of fate lay there. "'Oh, er, so you did. Very kind she has been to me. I got very little of this sort of thing at Vadi Halfa. "'By the way, Woodhouse,' Crandall blew a contemplative puff toward the ceiling. Strange Mrs. Sherman should have thought she saw you at Berlin. Odd mistake, to be sure, Woodhouse admitted, struggling to put ease into his voice. The lady seems to have a penchant, as her husband says, for finding familiar faces. Major Bishop, Jamir Khan announced at the double doors. The major in person followed immediately. His greeting to Woodhouse was constrained. Woodhouse will wait for you to go down the rock with him, Crandall explained to the newcomer. Captain, excuse us for a minute, while we go into my room and run over a little matter of fleet supplies. Must check up with the fleet before it sails in the morning. Woodhouse bowed his acquiescence, and saw the door to the general's room close behind the twain. He was not long alone. Noiselessly the double doors opened, and Jamir Khan entered. Woodhouse sprang to meet him, where he stood poised for flight just inside the doors. "'The woman's prattle of Berlin,' the Indian whispered. "'Yes, the general's suspicions are all aroused again.' "'Listen, 
I saw the note he sent to Bishop. The Major is to be set to watch you to-night, all night. A false step and you will be under arrest. Jamir's thin face was twisted in wrath. One man's life will not stand in our way now. No, Woodhouse affirmed. Success is very near. When Bishop goes with you down the rock— Yes, yes, what? The pistol screams, but the knife is dumb. Quick, Captain! With a swift movement of his hand, the Indian passed a thin-bladed dirk to the white man. The latter secreted the sheathed weapon in a pocket of his dinner-jacket. He nodded, understanding. One man's life, nothing! Jamir breathed. It shall be done, Woodhouse whispered. Jamir faded through the double doors like a spirit in a medium's cabinet. He had seen what the captain was slower to notice. The door from Jane Gerson's room was opening. The girl stepped swiftly into the room, and was by Woodhouse's side almost before he had seen her. "'I could not go away without—without—' "'Miss Gerson! Jane!' He was beside her instantly. His hand sought and found one of hers, and held it a willing prisoner. She was trembling, and her eyes were deep pools, riffled by conflicting currents. Her words came breathlessly. "'I was not myself. I tried to tell myself you were deceiving me, just—just just as a part of this terrible mystery you are involved in. But when I heard General Crandall tell you to wait, that, and what he said about the spies, I knew you were again in peril, and—and—' "'And you have come to tell me good-bye, as you believe I am honest, and that you care, a little?' Woodhouse's voice trembled with yearning. "'When you think me in danger, then you forget doubts, and maybe your heart—' "'Oh, I want to believe, I want to,' she whispered passionately. "'Everyone here is against you. Tell me you are on the level, with me at least.' I am, with you. I believe, she sighed, and her head fell near his shoulder, so near that with alacrity Captain Woodhouse settled it there. When this war is over, if I am alive, he was saying rapturously, may I come to America for you? Will you wait? Perhaps. The door to General Crandall's room opened. They sprang apart, just as Crandall and Bishop entered the library. The former was not blind to the situation. He darted a swift glance into the girl's face, and read much there. "'Ready, Captain?' Bishop chirped, affecting not to notice the momentary confusion of the man and the girl. Woodhouse gave Jane's hand a lingering clasp. Mutely his eyes adjured her to remember her plighted troth. In another minute he was gone. The general and his guest were alone. Jane Gerson was bidding him good-night when he interrupted, somewhat gruffly. "'Well, young woman, have you made up your mind? Do you sail in the morning, or not?' "'I made up my mind to that long ago,' she answered briskly. "'Of course I sail.' "'Then you're going to tell me what I want to know. Sensible girl!' He rubbed his hands in satisfaction. What is it you want to know, General Crandall? This almost carelessly from her. When did you meet Woodhouse before, and where? How do you know I met him before? She attempted to parry, but Crandall cut her short with a gesture of impatience. Please don't try that tack again. Answer those two questions, and you sail in the morning. Jane Gerson's eyes grew hard, and she lifted her chin in defiance. And if I refuse? Why should you? Crandall affected surprise, not altogether unfelt. No matter, I do. The challenge came crisp and sharp cut as a new blade. Gibraltar's governor lost his temper instantly. His face purpled. And I know why, he rasped. He's got round you, made love to you, tricked you. I'd swear he was kissing you just the minute I came in here. The German cad! Good Lord, girl, can't you see how he's using you? I'm afraid I can't. Crandall advanced toward her, shaking a menacing finger at her. Let me tell you something, young woman. He's at the end of his rope. Done for. No use for you to stand up for him longer. 
He's under guard tonight, and a woman named Josepha, his accomplice, or maybe his dupe, is already under arrest, and tomorrow, when we examine her, she'll reveal his whole rotten schemes or have to stand against a wall with him. Come now, throw him over. Don't risk your job, as you call it, for a German spy who's tricked you, made a fool of you. Why— General Crandall? Her voice was white, and her eyes glowed with anger. I—I I beg your pardon, Miss Gerson, he mumbled. I am exasperated. A fine girl like you, to throw away all your hopes and ambitions for a spy, and a bounder. Can't you see you're wrong? General Crandall, some time, I hope it will be soon, you will apologize to me, and to Captain Woodhouse, for what you are saying tonight. Her hands clenched into fists, whereon the knuckles showed white. The poise of her head, held a little forward, was all combative. "'Then you won't tell me what I want to know?' He could not but read the defiance in the girl's pose. "'I will tell you nothing but good-bye.' "'No, by gad, you won't. I can be stubborn, too. You shan't sail on the Saxonia in the morning, understand?' "'Oh, shan't I? Who will dare stop me?' "'I will, Miss Gerson. I have plenty of right, and the power, too.' I'll ask you to tell that to my consul, on the dock at five to-morrow morning. Until then, General Crandall, au revoir." The door of the guest-room shut with a spiteful slam upon the master of Gibraltar, leaving him to nurse a grievance on the knees of wrath. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Inside the Lines » by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 3.30 a.m. Joseph Almer and Captain Woodhouse sat in the darkened and heavily blinded office reception room of the Hotel Splendide. All the hotel had long since been put to bed, and the silence in the rambling house was audible. The hands of the Dutch clock on the wall were pointing to the hour of three-thirty. Strain was on both the men. They spoke in monosyllables, and only occasionally. Almer's hand went out from time to time to lift a squat bottle of brandy from the table between them, and pour a tiny glass brimful. He quaffed with a sucking noise. Woodhouse did not drink. "'It is three-thirty,' the latter fretted, with an eye on the mottled clock dial. He will come, Almer assured. A long pause. This man, Jamir, is he thoroughly dependable? The man in uniform put the question with petulant brusqueness. It is his passion, what we are to do tonight, something he has lived for, his religion. Nothing except Judgment Day could... Ha! The sharp chirp of a telephone bell, a dagger of sound in the silence, broke Almer's speech. He bounded to his feet, but not so quickly as Woodhouse, who was across the room in a single stride, and had the receiver to his ear. "'Well, well, yes, this is the one you name,' Woodhouse turned to Almer, and his lips framed the word, Jamir. "'Yes, yes, all is well, and waiting. Bishop? He is beyond interference. Coming down the rock, I did the work silently. What's that?' Woodhouse's face was tensed in strain. His right hand went to a breast pocket and brought out a pencil. With it he began making memoranda on the face of a calendar by his side. Seven turns. Ah, yes, four to the left. Correct. His writing hand was moving swiftly. Press, one to the right. Good, I have it, and am off at once. Good-bye. Woodhouse finished a line of script on the calendar face, hung up the receiver. He carefully tore the written notes from the calendar and put them into his pocket. "'Jamir says he has work to do at Government House and cannot come down,' Woodhouse turned to Almer and explained in rapid sentences. "'But he's given me the combination, to room D, over the wire, and now I'm off.' Almer was all excitement now. He hovered lovingly about Woodhouse, patted him on the shoulder, giving him his helmet, mothering him with little cooing noises. 
Speed quickly, 1932, up the rock to the signal tower, 1932, to do the deed that will boom around the world. The switches, one pull, my brother, and the fatherland is saved to triumph over her enemies, victorious. Right, Homer. Woodhouse was moving toward the door. In eight minutes history will be made. The minute you hear the blast, start for Spain. I will try to escape, but I doubt. A knock came at the barred front door, one knock, followed by three. Both men were transfixed. Almer, first to recover his calmness, motioned Woodhouse through the door to the dining-room. When his companion had disappeared, he stepped to the door and cautiously asked, "'Who knocks?' An answer came that caused him to shoot back the bolts and thrust out his head. A message was hurriedly whispered into his ear. The Splendide's proprietor withdrew his head and slipped the bolt home again. His face was a thundercloud as he summoned Woodhouse. His breath came in wheezy gasps. "'My Arab boy comes to the door just now to tell me of Louise's fate. She has been arrested,' he said. "'Come, Almer, I am going to the signal tower. There is still time for us to strike.' Out on to Waterport Street leaped Woodhouse, and the door closed behind him. End of chapter 17 Chapter Eighteen of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Trap is Sprung. Jane Gerson, tossing on her pillows, heard the mellow bell of a clock somewhere in the dark and silent house strike three. This was the fifth time she had counted the measured strokes of that bell as she lay, wide eyed, in the guest chamber's canopied bed. An eternity had passed since the dinner guest's departure. Her mind was racing like some engine gone wild, and sleep was impossible. Over and over again she had conned the events of the evening, always to come at the end against the impasse of General Crandall's blunt denial. You shan't sail in the morning. In her extremity she had even considered flight by stealth, the scaling of walls perhaps, and a groping through dark streets to the wharf there to smuggle herself somehow on a tender and so gain the saxonia but her precious gowns they still reposed in their bulky hampers here in government house to escape and leave them behind would be worse than futile the governor's fiat seemed absolute urged by the impulse of sheer necessity to be doing something the bed had become a rack the girl rose lit a taper and began to dress herself moving noiselessly she even packed her travelling bag to the last inch and locked it then she sat on the edge of the bed hands helplessly folded in her lap what to do next was she any better off dressed than thrashing in the bed her yearning called up a picture of the saxonia which must ere this be at her anchorage since the consul said she was due at two in three short hours tenders would puff alongside. A happy procession of refugees climbed the gangway, among them the Shermans and Willie Kimball bound for their Kiwani. The captain on the bridge would give an order, winches would puff, the anchor heave from the mud, the big boat's prow slowly turn westward, oceanward, toward New York. And she, a prisoner caught by the mischance of war's great mystery, would have to watch that diminishing column of smoke fade against the morning's blue, disappear. Inspiration seized her. It would be something just to see the Saxonia, now lying among the grim monsters of the war fleet. From the balcony of the library, just outside the door of her room, she could search the darkness of the harbour for the prickly rows of lights marking the merchant ship from her darker neighbours. The general's marine glasses lay on his desk, she remembered, to steal out to the balcony, sweep the harbour with the glasses, and at last hit on the ship of deliverance for all but her. To do this would be better than counting the hours alone. She softly opened the door of her room. Beyond lay the dim distances of the library, suddenly become vast as an amphitheatre. In the thin light filtering through the curtains screening the balcony appeared the lumpy masses of furniture and vague outlines of walls and doors. 
She closed the door behind her, and stood trembling. This was somehow like burglary, she felt. At least it had the thrill of burglary. The girl tiptoed around a high-backed chair, groped her way to the general's desk, and fumbled there. Her hand fell upon the double tubes of the binoculars. She picked them up, parted the curtains, and stepped through the opened glass doors to the balcony. Not a sound anywhere, but the faint cluck and cackle of cargo hoists down in the harbour. Jane put the glasses to her eyes, and began to sweep the light-pointed vista below the cliff. Scores of pinprick beams of radiance marked the fleet where it choked the roadstead, red and white beetles' eyes in the dark. She swung the glasses nearer shore. Ah, there lay the Saxonia, with her three rows of glowing portholes near the water. The binoculars even picked out the double column of smoke from her stacks. Three brief hours, and that mass of shadow would be moving, moving. A noise, very slight, came from the library behind the open doors. The marine glasses remained poised in the girl's hands while she listened. Again the noise, a faint metallic click. She hardly breathed. Turning ever so slowly, she put one hand between the curtains and parted them so that she could look through into the cavernous gloom behind her. A light moved there, a clear round eye of light. Behind it was the faintest suggestion of a figure at the double doors. Just a blur of white it was. But it moved stealthily, swiftly. She heard a key turn in a lock. Then swiftly the eye of light travelled across the library to the door leading to General Crandall's room. There it paused to cut the handle of the door and keyhole beneath out of darkness. A brown hand slipped into the clear shaft of whiteness, put a key into the keyhole, and softly turned it. The same was done for the locks of Lady Crandall's door, on the opposite side of the library, and for the one Jane had just closed behind her, her own door. Then the circle of light, seeming to have an intelligence all its own, approached the desk, flew swiftly to a drawer, and there paused. Once more the brown hand plunged into the bore of light. The drawer was carefully opened, and a steel-blue revolver reflected bright sparks from its barrel as it was withdrawn. Jane, hardly daring to breathe, and with the heavy curtains gathered close, so that only a space for her eyes was left open, watched the orb of light, fascinated. It groped under the desk, found a nest of slender wires. There was a snick, snick, and the severed ends of the wires dropped to the floor. The burnished dial of the wall safe, set near the double doors, was the next object to come under the restless searching eye. While light poured steadily upon the circular bit of steel, delicate fingers played with it, twisting and turning this way and that. Then they were laid upon the handle of the safe door, and it swung noiselessly back. A tapering brown hand, white-sleeved, fumbled in a small drawer, withdrew a packet of papers, and selected one. Jane stepped boldly into the room. Sahiba! The white club of the electric flash smote her full in the face. What are you doing at that safe, Jamir Khan? Jane spoke as steadily as she could though excitement had its fingers at her throat, and all her nerves were twittering. She heard some sharply whistled foreign word, which might have been a curse. "'Something that concerns you not at all, Sahiba,' the Indian answered, his voice smooth as oil. He kept the light fair on her face. "'I intend that it shall concern me,' the girl answered, taking a step forward. "'Very, very foolish, Sahiba.' Jamir whispered, and with cat-like stride he advanced to meet her. "'Very foolish to come here at this time.' Jane, frozen with horror at the man's approach, dodged and ran swiftly to the fireplace, where hung the ancient vesper bell. The flashlight followed her every move, picked out her hand as it swooped down to seize a heavy poker standing in its rack beside the bell. "'Sahiba, do not strike that bell!' The warning came sharp and cold as frost. Her hand poised over the bell, the heavy stub of the poker a very few inches away from the bell's flare. To strike that bell might involve in great trouble one who is very dear to you, Sahiba. Let us talk this over most calmly. 
surely you would not desire that a friend a very dear friend who do you mean she asked sharply ah that i leave to you to guess jamir khan's voice was silken but certainly you know sahiba a friend the most important then she suddenly understood the indian was referring to captain woodhouse thus glibly anger blazed in her it isn't true sahiba i am sorry to contradict Jemir khan had begun slowly to creep toward her his body crouching slightly as a stalking cat's i'll prove it isn't true she cried and brought the poker down on the bell with a sharp blow like a toxin came its answering alarm a thousand devils the indian leaped for the girl but she evaded him and ran to put the desk between herself and him he had snapped off the torch at the clang of the bell and now he was a pale ghost in the gloom fearsome hissing indian curses he started to circle the desk to seize her open this door open it i say it was the general's voice sounding muffled through the panels of his door he rattled the knob viciously jane tried to run to the door but the indian seized her from behind threw her aside and made for the double doors there his hand went to a panel in the wall turned a light switch and the library was on the instant drenched with light jamir khan threw before the door of the safe the bundle of papers he was clutching when jane discovered him and which he had gripped during the ensuing tense moments then he stepped swiftly to the general's door and unlocked it general crandall clad only in trousers and shirt burst into the room his eyes leaped from the indian to where jane was cowering behind his desk what the devil is this he rasped jane opened her mouth to answer but the indian forestalled her the sahiba general i found her here before your opened safe good god general crandall's eyes blazed he leaped to the safe knelt and peered in a clever job young woman jane completely stunned by the indian's swift strategy could hardly speak she held up a hand appealing for a hearing general crandall eyed her with chilling scorn then turned to his servant you have done well jamir it 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 isn't true jane stammered the governor took a step toward her almost as if under impulse to strike her but he halted and his lips curled in scorn by gad working with woodhouse all the time eh and i thought you a simple young woman he had trapped even warned you against him not six hours ago what a fool i've been jane impulsively stretched forth her arms for the mercy of a hearing but the man went on implacably i said he was making a fool of you and all the time you were making one of me clever young woman i say that must have been a great joke for you making a fool of the governor of gibraltar you make me ashamed of myself and my servant jamir here it is left to him to trap you while i am blind bah jamir my orderly at once the indian smiled sedately and started for the double doors jane ran toward the general with a sharp cry general let me explain <laughs> explain he laughed shortly what can you say you come into my house as a friend you betray me you break into my safe with woodhouse whom i'd warned you against directing your every move clever clever jamir do as i tell you my orderly at once jane threw herself between the indian and the doors one moment before he leaves the room let me tell you he lies your indian lies it was i who found him here before that safe a poor story the general sniffed i expected better of you after this the truth general crandall i couldn't sleep i came out here to the balcony to try to make out if the saxonia was in the bay he came into the room while i was behind these curtains locked the doors and opened the safe it won't go the general cut in curtly it's the truth it's got to go she cried jamir at a second nod from his master was approaching the double doors jane leaping in front of them pushed the indian back 
general crandall for your own sake don't let this indian leave the room you may regret it all the rest of your life he still has a paper a little paper he took from that safe i saw him stick it in his sash nonsense search him the girl's voice cracked in hysteria her face was dead white with hectic burning spots in each cheek i'm not pleading for myself now for you search him before he leaves this room jimir put strong hands on her arms to force her away from the door his black eyes were laughing down into hers let me ask him a question first general crandall before he leaves this room the governor's face reflected momentary surprise at this change of tack quickly then he gruffly conceded jimir khan stepped back a pace his eyes meeting the girl's coldly how did you come into the room when you found me here she challenged the indian pointed to the double doors over her shoulder she reached behind her grasped the knob and shook it locked she announced why not jimir asked i locked them after me and the general's door was locked yes yes crandall broke in impatiently what's this got to do with did you lock the general's door she questioned the indian no sahiba you did and i suppose i locked the door to lady crandall's room and my door if they too are locked yes sahiba then why jane's voice quavered almost to a shriek why had i failed to lock the double doors the doors through which you came the indian caught his breath and darted a look at the general the latter eyeing him keenly stepped to his desk and pressed a button very good remain here jamir he said then to jane i will have him searched as you wish then both of you go to the cells until i sift this thing to the bottom general you wouldn't dare she stood aghast wouldn't i though we'll see whether a sharp click sent his head jerking around to the right jamir khan at the door to the general's room was just slipping the key into his girdle after having turned the lock his thin face was crinkled like old sheepskin what the devil are you doing crandall exploded if the general sahib is waiting for that bell to be answered he need not wait longer it will not be answered jamir khan purred what's this what's this the wires are cut cut who did that the general started for the yellow man jamir khan whipped a blue-barrelled revolver out of his broad sash and levelled it at his master back general sahib i cut them the sahiba's story is true it was she who came in and found me at the safe my god you jamir you a spy the general collapsed weakly into a chair by the desk some might call me that my general jamir's weapon was slowly swinging to cover both the seated man and the girl by the doors no need to search that drawer general sahib your pistol is pointing at you this minute you'll pay for this crandall gasped that may be one thing i ask you to remember if one of you makes a move i will kill you both you are a gallant man my general is it not so then remember crandall started from his chair but the uselessness of his bare hands against the snub-nosed thing of blue metal covering him struck home he sank back with a groan keeping them both carefully covered jamir moved to the desk telephone at the general's elbow he took from his sash a small piece of paper the one he had saved from the packet of papers taken from the safe laid it on the edge of the desk and with his left hand he picked up the telephone an instant of tense silence broken by the wheezing of the general's breath then nine two six if you please yes yes who is this ah yes it is i jamir khan is all well with you good and bishop slain coming down the rock good also crandall groaned the indian continued his conversation unperturbed very good listen closely i cannot come as i have promised there is work for me here but all will be well take down what i shall tell you 
he read the slip of paper on his desk seven turns to the right four to the left press two more to the left press one to the right you have that allah speed you go quickly room d crandall had leaped from his chair correct my general room d jamir smiled as he stepped away from the telephone his back against the double doors the sweat stood white on crandall's brow his mouth worked in jerky spasms what what have you done he gasped i see the general knows too well came the indian's silken response i have given the combination of the inner door of room d in the signal tower to a friend he is on his way to the tower he will be admitted one of the few men on the rock who could be admitted at this hour my general one pull of the switches in room d and where will england's great fleet be then you yellow devil crandall started to rush the white figure by the doors but his flesh quailed as the round cold muzzle met it he staggered back we are going to wait my general and you american sahiba who have pushed your way into this affair we are going to wait and listen listen the general writhed in agony jane fallen into a chair by the far edge of the desk had her head buried in her arms and was sobbing and we are going to think my general the indian's voice purred on while we wait we shall think who will general crandall be after to-night the english sahib who ruled the rock the night the english fleet was blown to hell from inside the fortress how many widows will curse when they hear his name what jamir khan what have i ever done to you the governor's voice sounded hardly human his face was blotched and purple not what you have done my general what the english army has done an old score general thirty years old my father he was a prince in india until this english army took away his throne to give it to a lying brother the army the english army murdered my father when he tried to get it back called it mutiny ah yes an old score but by the breath of allah to-night shall see it paid the man's eyes were glittering points of white-hot steel all of his thin white teeth showed like a hound's you dog the general feebly wagged his head at the indian your dog my general five years your dog when i might have been a prince my friend goes up the rock step 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 closer closer to the tower my general and major bishop where is he ah a knife is swift and makes no noise what a fool i've been crandall rocked in his chair and passed a trembling hand before his eyes sudden rage turned his bloodshot eyes to where the girl was stretched sobbing across the desk your man the man you protected it is he who goes to the signal tower girl no no it can't be she whispered between the rackings of her throat it is only a member of the signal service could gain admittance into the tower to-night besides who was it went with bishop down the rock after the dinner to-night and i i sent bishop with him sent him to his death he was tricking you all the time i told you he was i warned you he was playing with you using you for his own rotten ends using you to help kill forty thousand men it needed not the sledge-hammer blows of the stricken crandall to batter jane gerson's heart she had read too clearly the full story jamir khan's sketchy comments had outlined she knew now captain woodhouse spy the indian was talking again his words dropping as molten metal upon their raw souls forty thousand men a pleasant thought my general eight minutes up the rock to the tower when one moves fast and my friend ah he moves very very fast eight minutes and four have already passed watch the windows the windows looking out to the bay general and sahiba they will flame like blood your hearts will stop at the great noise and then a knock sounded at the double doors behind jamir he stopped short startled 
all listened again came the knock without turning his eyes from the two he guarded shamir asked who is it woodhouse came the answer jane's heart stopped crandall sat frozen in his seat Jamir turned the key in the lock, and the doors opened. In stepped Captain Woodhouse, helmeted, armed with sword and revolver at waist. He stood facing the trio, his swift eye taking in the situation at once. Crandall half rose from his seat, his face apoplectic. "'Spy! Secret killer of men!' he gasped. Woodhouse paid no heed to him, but turned to Jamir. "'Quick! the combination he said over the phone afraid i might not have it right stopped here on my way to the tower be there in less than three minutes if you can hold these people everything is all right jamir asked suspiciously you mean bishop yes quick the combination jamir picked the slip of paper containing the formula from the edge of the desk with his disengaged left hand and passed it to woodhouse the latter stretched out his hand, grasped the Indians with a lightning move, and threw it over so that the latter was off his balance. In a twinkling, Woodhouse's left hand had wrenched the revolver from Jameer's right and pinioned it behind his back. The whole movement was accomplished in half a breath. Jameer Khan knelt in agony, and in peril of a broken wrist at the white man's feet, disarmed, harmless. Woodhouse put a silver whistle to his lips and blew three short blasts. A tramp of feet in the hallway outside, and four soldiers with guns filled the doorway. "'Take this man,' Woodhouse commanded. The Indian, in a frenzy, writhed and shrieked. "'Traitor! English spy! Dog of an unbeliever!' The soldiers jerked him to his feet and dragged him out. His ravings died away in the passage." Woodhouse brought his hand up in a salute as he faced General Crandall. "'The other spy, Almer, of the Hotel Splendide, has just been arrested, sir. Major Bishop has taken charge of him and has lodged him in the cells.' A high-pitched scream sounded behind Lady Crandall's door, and a pounding on the panels. Jane Gerson, first to recover from the shock of surprise, ran to unlock the door. Lady Crandall, in a dressing-gown, burst into the library, and flung herself on her husband. "'George! George! What does all this mean? Yells! Whistling!' General Crandall gave his wife a pat on the shoulder, and put her aside with a mechanical gesture. He took a step toward Woodhouse, who still stood stiffly before the opened doors. The dazed governor walked like a somnambulist. "'Who? Who the devil are you, sir?' he managed to sputter. I am Captain Cavendish, General. Again the hand came to stiff salute on the visor of the pith helmet. Captain Cavendish, of the signal service, stationed at Khartoum, but lately detached for special service under the intelligence office in Downing Street. The man's eyes jumped for an instant to seek Jane Gerson's face, found a smile breaking through the lines of doubt there. Your papers to prove your identity. Crandall demanded, still in a fog of bewilderment. "'I haven't any, General Crandall,' the other replied, with a faint smile. "'Or your Indian, Jamir Khan, would have placed them in your hands after the search of my room yesterday. I've convinced Major Bishop of my genuineness, however, after we left your house and when the moment for action arrived. A cable to Sir Ludlow's service, in the Downing Street office, will confirm my story.' Meanwhile, I am willing to go under arrest, if you think best. But, but, I don't understand. Captain er, Cavendish, you posed as a German, as an Englishman. Briefly, General, a girl secretly in the pay of the Downing Street office, Louisa Schmidt, Josepha, the cigar girl, whom you ordered locked up a few hours ago, is the English representative in the Wilhelmstrasse at Berlin. She learned of a plan to get a German spy in your signal tower a month before war was declared, reported it to London, and I was summoned from Khartoum to London to play the part of the German spy. At Berlin, where she had gone from your own town of Gibraltar to meet me, she arranged to procure me a number in the Wilhelmstrasse through the agency of a dupe named Capper. Capper! 
good lord crandall stammered with the number i hurried to alexandria woodhouse captain woodhouse from vadi halfa a victim poor chap to the necessities of our plan fell into the hands of the wilhelmstrasse men there and i gained possession of his papers the germans started him in a robber caravan of bedouins for the desert but i provided against his getting far before being rescued and the german agents there were all rounded up the day i sailed as woodhouse and you came here to save gibraltar and the fleet from german spies crandall put the question dazedly there were only two general almer and your servant jamir we have them now you may order the release of louisa schmidt the captain has overlooked one other the most dangerous one of all general crandall jane stepped up to where the governor stood and threw back her hands with an air of submission her name is jane gerson of new york and she knew all along that this gentleman was deceiving you she had met him in fact three weeks before on a railroad train in france the startled eyes of gibraltar's master looked first at the set features of the man then to the girl's flushed face little lines of humour crinkled about the corners of his mouth captain cavendish or woodhouse make this girl a prisoner your prisoner sir End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At the Quay Five o'clock at the quay, and already the new day was being made raucous by the bustle of departure. Shouts of porters, tenders jangling engine bells, thump of trunks dropped down skidways, lamentations of voyagers vainly hunting baggage mislaid. Out in the stream, the Saxonia, a clean white ship, veritable ark of refuge for pious Americans escaping the deluge. In the midst of a group of his countrymen, Henry J. Sherman stood, feet wide apart, and straw hat cocked back over his bald spot. He was narrating the breathless incidents of the night's dark hour. "'Yes, sir. A soldier comes to our rooms about three-thirty o'clock and hammers on our door. Everybody in this hotel's under arrest,' he says. "'Kindly dress as soon as possible and report to Major Bishop in the office.' and we not five hours before the guests of general and lady crandall at government house what do you think of that for a quick change well gentlemen we piled downstairs with me minus a collar button and having to hold my collar down behind with my hand and what do we find this chap almer with a face like a side of cream cheese standing in the middle of a bunch of soldiers with guns another bunch of soldiers surrounding his arab boy who's as innocent a little fella as ever you set your eyes on. And this Major Bishop walkin' up and down, all excited, and sayin' something about somebody's got a scheme to blow up the whole fleet out there. Which might have been done, he says, if it wasn't for that fella Woodhouse we'd had dinner with just that very evening. Who's some sort of a spy. I knew it all the time, you see." Mrs. Sherman was quick to claim her share of her fellow tourist's attention. "'Only he's a British spy set to watch the Germans. Major Bishop told me that in confidence after it was all over. Said he never met a man with the nerve this Captain Woodhouse has.' "'Better whisper that word, spy, soft,' Henry J. admonished sotto voce. "'We're not out of this plagued Europe yet, and we've had about all the excitement we can stand don't want anybody to arrest us again just the minute we're sailin'. But, as I was sayin', there we all stood, foolish as goats, until in comes General Crandall, followed by this Woodhouse chap. Excuse me, people, for causing you this little inconvenience, the General says. Major Bishop has taken his orders too literal. If you'll go back to your rooms and finish dressin', I'll have the army bus down here to take you to the quay. The Hotel Splendide's accommodations have been slightly disarranged by the arrest of its worthy proprietor. So back we go, and—by cricky, mother, 
Here comes the general and Mrs. Crandall now. Henry J. broke through the ring of prisoners, and with a waving of his hand, rushed to the curb. A limousine bearing the governor, his lady, and Jane Gerson, and with two bulky hampers strapped to the baggage rack behind, was just drawing up. "'Why, of course we're down here to see you off, and bid you Godspeed to little old Kiwani. Lady Crandall was quick to anticipate the Sherman's greetings. General Crandall, beaming indulgently on the group of homegoers, had a hand for each. "'Yes, yes,' he exclaimed. "'After arresting you at three o'clock, we're here to give you a clean ticket at five. Couldn't do more than that, what? Regrettable occurrence and all that, but give you something to tell the stay-at-homes about when you get back to, ah, uh... "'Kiwani, Illinois, General.' Sherman was quick to supply. No town like it this side of the pearly gates. No doubt of it, Sherman. Crandall heartily agreed. A quiet place, I'll wager. Think I'd relish a touch of your Kiwani after, uh, life on Gibraltar. Jane Gerson, who had been standing in the car, anxiously scanning the milling crowd about the landing stage, caught sight of a white helmet and khaki-clad shoulders pushing through the nearer fringes of travellers. She slipped out of the limousine unseen, and waited for the white helmet to be doffed before her. "'I was afraid maybe—' the girl began, her cheeks suddenly flaming. "'Afraid that, after all, it wasn't true?' The man she had found in war's vortex finished, his grey eyes compelling hers to tell him their whole message. "'Afraid that Captain Cavendish might be as vile a deceiver as Woodhouse?' Does Cavendish have to prove himself all over again, little girl? No, no. Her hands fluttered into his, and her lips were parted in a smile. It's Captain Woodhouse I want to know, always, the man whose pledged word I held to. It must have been hard, he murmured, but you were splendid, splendid. No, I was not. Tears came to dim her eyes, and the hands he held trembled. Once, in one terrible moment this morning, when Jamir told us you were going to the signal tower, when we waited, waited to hear that awful noise, my faith failed me. I thought you— Forget that moment, Jane, dearest. A saint would have denied faith then. They were silent for a minute, their hearts quailing before the imminent separation. He spoke. Go back to the States now. Go back and show this Hildebrand person you're a wonder, a prize. Show him what I've known more and more surely every moment since that meeting in Calais. But give him fair warning. He's going to lose you. Lose me? she echoed. Inevitably. Listen, girl. In a year my term of service is up, and if the war's over I shall leave the army, come to the States to you, and— and do you think I could become a good American? If, if you have the proper teacher, the girl answered, with a flash of mischief. All aboard for the Saxonia! It was Consul Reynolds, fussed, perspiring, overwhelmed with the sense of his duty, who bustled up to where the Shermans were chatting with Lady Crandall and the General. Reynolds' sharp eye caught an intimate tableau on the other side of the auto. "'And that means you, Miss Step Lively, New York,' he shouted. "'Much as I hate to, uh, interrupt.' Jane Gerson saw her two precious hampers stemming away through the crowd on the backs of porters, bound for the tender's deck. She could not let them out of her sight. "'Wait, Jane!' His hands were on her arms, and he would not let her go. "'Will you be my teacher? I want no other.' My terms are high, she tried to smile, though trembling lips belied her. I'll pay with my life, he whispered, in a quick gust of passion. Here's my promise. He took her in his arms, and between them passed the world-old pledge of man and girl. End of chapter 19 End of Inside the Lines by Earl Biggers and Robert Ritchie Recording by Lee Smalley